illegal. So our night of political debate starts now on BBC One with David Dimbleby. Tonight finds us in Stirling, and welcome to Question Time. Good evening, a big welcome to our audience here, and of course to our panel, the Scottish Secretary and Liberal Democrat Michael Moore, Labour's former Justice Secretary, Charlie Faulkner, from the Scottish Government, Hamza Yousaf, appointed SNP Minister for External Affairs at the tender age of 27. Mary MacLeod, who is Scottish and Conservative MP for the London constituency of Brentford and Isleworth, and the businessman, co-founder of Stagecoach and major donor to the SNP, Brian Souter. <laughs> Thanks very much. Our first question from Tom McGee, please. Tom McGee. Are the appalling standards found at Stafford Hospital a sign of things to come for our NHS due to austerity? The NHS austerity and what's happened at Stafford. Uh, Who would like to start with this? Hamza Youssef. Well, you know, I mean, it's a good question uh, from Tom, and I think uh, actually credit to the Prime Minister for the statement that he made. You know, I think it was absolutely in the right tone, uh, and I don't think any of us, uh, until we're caught up in something like that, and, you know, God forbid we ever are. Uh, could understand what the families have had to go through and well done for them for their tenacity for pursuing that. Um, but look, look, our NHS up here in Scotland is not without its difficulties, is not without its challenges. I would never attempt to say that at all. But why I don't think we've had an issue like we've had uh, in, in, in England and the English NHS is that we are going in a different direction. In Scotland, we're talking about going back to the founding principles of the NHS. So look, you take away private cleaning contracts and now this week we see the lowest rate of hospital acquired infections for years. And what happens in the, in, in the English NHS is that you have a two-tier system that's opening up. And what is the result of that? Privatisation, be it from when Lord Faulkner was in the Cabinet and voted through foundation hospitals, or be it from PFI, which we thankfully discarded. What you have is NHS trusts almost in liquidation. What you have is 60 NHS hospitals in England and Wales possibly under threat of closure. Well, thank God that we took the private element. And let's ensure all of us here, regardless of whether it's an independent Scotland or not, regardless of whether it's the SNP that's in power or not, let's make sure that we endeavour in Scotland that this NHS stays in the public's hands and never, ever goes down the route of privatisation. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll come to you, Charlie Faulkner, because it was under Labour that these things happened at Stafford. What do you say to what he says? Uh, Robert Francis is the guy who looked into it. He wasn't saying it was to do with privatisation. It was to do, ultimately, with a hospital which abandoned all the most basic principles of care and compassion. Okay, and he... Charlie, I did say on page 19 of the report, if you read it very clearly, that the focus was there in terms of getting the hospital up to foundation trust status. Yeah, what, so foundation hospitals yeah. did play a uh, part. You can't the, be... The way you put it, Hamza, was you were saying it's to do with privatisation. Foundation hospital status is about giving a hospital greater autonomy. But what Francis described in this is absolutely appalling. There's absolutely no getting away from it. Uh, and he describes a place where there were 25 different inspections mm. and none of them picked up what was going on, I think two things went really badly wrong. Lots and lots of reorganisations of the health service done by Labour and done by the Tories, and they have been disastrous in many respects. All? Both Labour and Tories? Yeah, I think they have been, they've been a, a bad mistake because you end up in a situation where the people who are looking at the hospitals don't understand what's going on in relation to the hospital. And then secondly, and I think... This is very much something that happened under both governments, not listening to the voice of the patient. And again, I accept Labour's responsibility for that. <laughs> ..wasn't listened to, and as a result, you get those appalling things that happened in Mid-Staffordshire. What do you but say I, to, what do you I say agree to with the what point that Francis, about the, uh, Francis made? Not, not about privatisation, but yeah. the failures were in part due to a focus on reaching targets. Yeah. That was a Blairite thing, your old friend. Uh, and achieving financial balance. 
We were keen when we arrived in 1997 to try to improve standards in the health service. A lot of people were dying on waiting lists. The health service was not in a good way. And one of the things that we did was to introduce shorter waiting lists in order to try to drive up standards. <coughs> it was never part of that that hospitals would completely abandon the basic compassion that is required from a hospital as happened okay. in mid Staffordshire. Okay. We, need, we need to learn the lessons and I agree with what Hamza says that the Prime Minister uh, Mr Cameron was right in the tone that he set. This should never be allowed to happen again but there are deep lessons to be learned and I don't think we should be complacent about the health service anywhere. Right. It's not to do with privatisation, it's to do with the sorts of pressures that was referred to in the question by Tom. The, the man in, the, in green there, you sir. Most of us who go for work on a regular basis, we succeed or fail on our own basis. You politicians are there as our representatives and you are the people who must do something about fixing it. I don't see why we as the public will let people go off into a sunset with a pension. These people who failed us, the people, can go off with a big fat pension. You people <coughs> want to take responsibility. That's what we need to see. You mean you want to see people sacked as a result of this? Those who've done wrong, certainly. I ran a small business. I succeeded or failed on my own efforts. I didn't rely on a big bureaucracy. Okay. The people who work at the bottom, the people who have, when I've been in hospital, have given me great service, the nurses and the doctors, why aren't they doing it? What's the, what are the local health boards doing? These are meant to be elected people. Michael Moore, the question is about whether uh, it's a sign of things to come because of austerity in the NHS. Well, I, I, first of all, let me just echo what Charlie Humza have said, that uh, collectively we are just staggered and appalled at what happened in Midstaffs and the suffering of the individuals and the long, long campaign that the families have had to go through to get to this point where this report with its 290 recommendations has just systematically stripped away not just about individuals but about a culture in a hospital and that has was very very badly wrong and needed fixed and we will study all of those recommendations very very carefully indeed and publish a response to them uh, as quickly as possible uh, in the course of the next uh, month I would be very careful, if I might say to Hamza, about drawing a comparison and suggesting that there's nothing about the Scottish Health Service or about it might ever have any difficulties. I think I didn't say that. what I said, we I have said in we do the have NHS changes. across the UK are some fundamental shared values. About a, it was a collective effort on behalf of all people in the United uh, Kingdom. And I what, think what, the passion... What, what, what the, is? The, the NHS. The so fact why, why is, is it that people, so wrong? What happens well, in these hospitals? That is why... And there are another five that are being investigated now and another two more having legal... Uh, suits against them. It's not, it's not just Stafford. No, I, it's not, what is it? I, the, the, the critical thing, and what we must now reflect on post this Stafford show report, is exactly what is wrong with the culture? Where have we failed? The, the teamwork that was required to be there, the, the support from what nurses kind of to doctors. Work? No, just to get... Surely it's no, discipline for, that's needed, not well, teamwork, uh, isn't it? Actually, it's about... The Control, issue. not teamwork. It's about making sure we have an NHS where the nurses, the doctors, the clinicians, all those who support them, the, the, from the cleaners through to the managers, are all dedicated to ensure the best quality care for everybody who comes through those hospital doors. Now, clearly, and we have seen it, people have suffered very badly as a result of this. We need to make sure that across the country, whether it's here in Scotland or anywhere else in the UK, we live up to the highest standards right. and the values of the NHS, which still remain important to us to this day. Let's hear from one or two members of the audience. The, the, the woman there in the third row. Things started to go wrong when both Labour and Conservative governments put in managers who had no clinical or nursing backgrounds. They started to treat the NHS as a commodity. People are not commodities. People in hospital are vulnerable. They're at risk. And it's up to people in a managerial position to know what is required on the shop floor. Well, what you I, I agree with. I... I'd really like to respond to that point. I think, I think you've actually hit the kernel of the problem because what has happened over the last 20 years is we've been obsessed with putting professional managers and consultants into the health service. The chain of command is now so long 
that we actually haven't seen what the cleaner's doing, whether the ward's actually getting cleaned or not. We need to get back to a short chain of command and focused on the delivery of care, which, of course, nursing staff are first class at doing. The best engineering companies are run by engineers. The best science opportunities that I've invested in have been run by good scientists. And a good health service needs to be run by clinical specialists who understand the job. The nurses and doctors need to be given the power to operate the hospital. And it, and it... <laughs> Mayor McLeod, is, is he right? And is, that, is it that the problem, not money, not shortage of money? I, I would agree with Brian on this. Uh, my mother was a sister in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. And she would be absolutely horrified with what happened in, in, this, in these cases. Um, it was something that just was natural to nurses to go round on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. And that is the essence of what it means to be a nurse, is that caring um, aspect of it. And I think most nurses and doctors probably do go to work um, every day thinking they're going out there to help people and, and, and make them um, better. But this case just shows, the, I think, a real lack of leadership. It shows that the culture culture was, was, was not around in that hospital where people felt at any level within the NHS that they could report those things that were happening because people couldn't have been blind to this. This was something that they must have seen. And, and I'm just glad I mean, that it's everybody come to, in the hospital would have seen it. People would have seen this. This is not something no. that is just the odd incident. Um, and this was also about deaths as well, remember. And I really pay tribute to Julie Bailey, who persevered, and other family members, who absolutely persevered and were determined to take this right to where it is today, because without her and those others, we would never know that, that perhaps this had actually happened. Okay. i take a, a couple more points from the audience. But the plan the strike. Um, considering the question was about austerity, does the panel not think that at a time when the government is about to cut the level of taxes for the richest people in this country, that in fact money would better be spent in raising the salary of nurses who are doing fantastically long hours and in fact become embittered with the job that they're Charlie doing? Charlie Faulkner, do you think it's a matter of money? I agree with what's been said about you shouldn't reduce taxes at this particular point and you should spend more money on the public service. One of the unavoidable things to face up to in relation to the mid-staff's situation was, I agree with what Brian and Mary are saying about there was a lack of leadership, but Robert Francis is absolutely clear that the standards of nursing and the standards of medical care that were provided in mid-staffs were absolutely, to use his words, appalling. Mm -hmm. Now, that is because I think there was a lack of leadership. But if you listen to Julie Bailey, I don't know if any of you saw an absolutely excellent documentary on the telly yesterday, which was describing what happened. It was about the medical staff not giving people pain relief. It was about the medical staff not giving patients water. It was about the medical staff discharging people who were quite seriously ill. And there's one particular incident where the 20-year-old guy uh, uh, ruptured his spleen, died as a result. Now, I completely agree with you that leadership is required, but we need to be asking ourselves the question, and I don't know what the answer is, and I don't think Robert Francis knows what the answer is. Why did compassion depart you, you, from right, mid-staff? You, you talk about leadership. Julie Bailey, who you referred to, says that Sir David Nicholson, now the head of the NHS, should resign because he was, in effect, in charge. Do you think... He well, should he, resign? Well, Do you agree with her? Uh, he, he was, as I understand it, in charge of the trust for a year and then became the tr head of the trusts in London. I don't know enough about his role in relation to, to say, one way or the other. I mean, can, I, can I just come in, David? Yep. Because uh, a couple of points have been made. The original question was about his austerity to blame, and then the, the lady also tried to expand upon that point, I thought, quite well. Uh, and look, I actually don't think uh, austerity is necessarily to blame. It's, austerity is to blame for a lot. But politics has, uh, and we've seen this previously, that politics always has been a matter of priorities. So look, if you want to spend 25, or you want to allow 25 billion to escape our country legally through tax loopholes, if you want to spend 100 billion pounds on nuclear trident missiles, that's your choice. Are you saying but nurses if your are choice, if your choice, because if they're if you underpaid? No, if you don't... The point was that nurses are embittered because they're no, underpaid. No, that, that was the point what, you wasn't made. It wasn't just wasn't nurses. Is wasn't she right or not? Nurses. Yeah, no, look, but is that right? On morale, of course, uh, not spending into the NHS and at the front line, of course, has an effect on morale. And my question really was to, 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 to Mary as well that, that you spoke so eloquently about uh, the good job, no doubt, that your, your, your mother did, but would she not also be horrified? 
that there's now private cleaning contracts in our hospitals. I've got no doubt that she absolutely would. So politics is about priorities. And if you choose your priorities to be nuclear weapons and to be allowing, you know, tax to escape our country without closing down loopholes, that is your choice. Okay. You know, you'll be, you'll, you'll be judged at the ballot box for All it. Right. Thank you very much. I think we move on because we've had a quarter of an hour on this and we've got to get on. As you know, uh, uh, watching at home, you can certainly join this debate and it'd be good if you did. You can either text or use Twitter, our hashtag BBCQT. Uh, and as always, we have a Twitter panellist. Tonight it's John Rentoul, who's the chief political commentator of The Independent on Sunday. And you can follow him at BBC Extra Guest. Or you can text your comments, as I say, to 83981, push the red button to see what others are saying. Let's have a question, please, from Steve Newton. Is Chris Hewn such a danger to society that he deserves to go to jail? Michael Moore. I'm very sad about what has happened uh, to in, in the in the Shun family, and uh, however, Chris has pled guilty to a criminal offence, and I think he's taken the right steps in standing down as a member of uh, Parliament. That's a serious uh, charge that he faced. He's pled guilty to it. He's taken the right step now. But uh, is he such a danger to society? Was Mr. Newton's question that he deserves to go to jail for it? Well, Most people don't go to jail for things. Uh, may I just highlight one sensitivity about this is that he has not been sentenced yet uh, mm -hmm. and therefore I'd rather not comment on that. I, sure. I don't think that he should go to jail. He just went through a traffic. I mean, I will be joining him a very time soon because I'm always going through these cameras as well. And I think we've got this completely out of proportion. Now, he should not have perjured himself uh, and he will have to take the consequences of that. But I think we need a wee bit of reality check here. He didn't rob a bank. He just, he just went through a speed camera, and I'm going to make a confession on national television. <laughs> I was tempted to do the same thing myself at one point, but my wife wouldn't lie for me. <laughs> the careful conspiring, Sorry, conspiring to defeat... <laughs> yeah, what? Where, where, where does he stand with that remark? He's innocent. He didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to. He tried to, but he didn't do it. Uh, Charlie Faulkner, what do you, what do you I think? I do not think that Chris Hoon is a danger to society, and I think that Chris Hoon is paying a really terrible price himself and his family in a way that is absolutely shocking to read. Chris Hoon's problem, and the judge has effectively said to Chris Hoon he's going to prison, is because the courts take an incredibly serious view of somebody trying to mess with the court process. So what they say is, if you try and mess with this process, we will be really hard on you. Not because you are a danger to society. Chris is most certainly not a danger to society, but so that people know that with where the courts are concerned, you've got to be straight. And that is the error or the wrong that Chris committed. So I would be sympathetic to the idea of people who could be rehabilitated n not going to prison, but if you want a court system that functions effectively, which people respect, there's got to be a clear message sent, and I'm afraid Chris Hoon is the wrong end of that clear message. <laughs> Woman over there, on the right. He has pled guilty to perverting the course of justice, and so, therefore, what else has he perverted the course of justice in the line of being the MP that he was? He's perverted the course of justice by avoiding the consequence of having the penalty points. What Brian says is very telling. A lot of people would think that, you know, uh, maybe a lot of people are tempted to do that, maybe a lot of people do it, but if the courts find out, they've got to treat it seriously. That's the perversion of justice that he's committed, for which he's now going to be sentenced when the time comes. But it worries me what else has he actually avoided whilst being in power. Look, well, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know, because he's... If, if we, said, we will never know. We will never, still, you and I will never know. I still you, think that's you, a worry yeah, too. Yeah. You, got, you, got a, you got a ban for six months for speeding. I were, did. were you tempted at all? No, I was not. Because you I, were Lord Chancellor at the time. No, I, 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 I got. I, actually, I was, I was banned for six months. I went 37 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour limit. I was fined £3,000 and then got a note from the court saying, actually, the maximum is £1,000. Do you mind accepting a fine of £676? And I said I didn't mind accepting the, the, a fine. The, the person over there, uh, uh, you, sir, yes. Does this not highlight some of the issues with speed cameras? If a policeman pulls you over in his police car, he knows he's driving the car. With a speed camera, 
you, you can put someone else's name and then that person has to prove that they're innocent rather than being, well, if you're put over the police, is, is the police it, knows you're guilty. All right, Hamza, Hamza Yusuf. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to have a robust court system and in the end, I suppose, the lesson is that Chris Hewn uh, got caught out. And look, I mean, I, I echo a lot of what's being said. I mean, the family situation uh, is terrible and it, actually in politics... Sometimes it's hard to believe, but we're also human beings, uh, honestly, uh, on this side uh, as well. And it's never nice to have your family private lies plastered all over paper and, and television. But, you know, in some respects, no doubt, brought that upon himself for the actions that he took. Uh, but maybe just to, to give you one, maybe one comparison, look, I mean, you know, we have here uh, somebody who's guilty of passing the buck to his wife in terms of speeding, as Brian says, not the biggest criminal offence in the world. But yet we have, sorry to take it here, but we have bankers who passed the buck. So we've got a boss who stepped down, apparently in the RBS, who were told and had nothing to do with the LIBOR scandal. And we have fraud and corruption going on in our banks and nobody's been jailed. And I think that's much more of a bigger offence. OK. <laughs> and you said in the middle. And then I come to you, Mary. Yes. <laughs> that, no, <laughs> that, that, yes, you're on. Far away. Brian Souter came out with, oh, it's about a speeding fine. It's not about speeding fine. That is in the past. The thing is, was he committed perjury, and that is a criminal offence. Now, I don't think you should be prosecuted or worse than any other person, but the law is the law, and I think you should be, be found guilty of it. OK. And, and the woman in the second row here? The fact that um, he is a politician, and we are supposed to trust him, and Brian Souter may laugh and joke and say that, oh, he tried to get his wife to do the, take the, the penalty points... I mean, it's, it's appalling, and I'm so glad that uh, it all came out in the wash, and I was listening with great interest to Vicky Price this afternoon, having a real go at her ex-husband-to-be. Mm -hmm. It was appalling, and he's lied. I mean, there's no other, other way to say it. He, he, he's a liar. And how many other lies did he tell? <laughs> Mary McLeod. Um, in answer to the original question um, Steve raised, uh, he, Chris Hume is not a danger to the public, but I do feel strongly, perhaps like the, the lady there that, and, and the gentleman previously, who said that actually he did something wrong. Now, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the, the actual penalty points themselves. Many people get penalty points or drive a little bit over the speed limit. It was more about that he was perverting the, the course of justice. And that we have to come down hard on. And because if everyone did it on, on all sorts of things, then we wouldn't have a proper justice system. And we have to have that. So therefore, that is why um, I think that he'll be dealt with quite harshly. OK. Uh, just before we leave it, we've got a by-election coming up in Eastleigh as a result of this. Um, Michael Moore, if he's not a danger to society, is he a danger to the Liberal Democrats? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will uh, fight, uh, particularly against our, uh, Mary and her party, very vigorously in Eastleigh, uh, very determined to hold the seat. Uh, we've got an uh, excellent team of uh, councillors in Eastleigh. We have got a very good track record there, and I'm determined to see that we fight hard to get a new MP who can represent that part of the, the country. The very so, well. no, no, yeah. so, so, so damaged the Liberal Democrats in the political discourse. I think even the SNP should consider fielding its first candidate in England, yeah. perhaps, <laughs> uh, in order to, to see if we can get elected. Lord Ashcroft did a poll, and it shows the Tories in the lead there. Do you think uh, Tories will take it? We will absolutely work hard to take of it. I think it'll be, a, hard, it'll yeah. be a, a, a good fight there. Um, and, but it's, it's absolutely important um, in these by-elections that it's always difficult, I think, for a government to, to win a by-election. But we will put absolutely everything in it to try and win that um, by-election because then we can absolutely get uh, another MP in Eastleigh um, that can stand by the Conservative principles and deliver all the changes with it we're doing. And how is this battle going to sound between you and the Liberal Democrats? As we hear you day after day saying how close you are and what you've done for the country. And oh, well, hang on. Yeah. We're two very distinct uh, parties. You're going to fight. We, 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 absolutely. Yeah, this, really, this will, really, 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 really. Tell us about it. <laughs> it'll be a, a, a yeah. good uh, old-fashioned uh, political scrap, but confident as we are as Liberal Democrats that our vision of wanting you know, a stronger economy, a fairer society, making sure we can enable <laughs> everybody to get the chance to get on in life, that that vision of the future for the United Kingdom is the one that people in Eastleigh and other parts of 
the UK will want to endorse. So we will fight very vigorously, uh, very positively, uh, and look forward to the outcome in a few weeks' time. So you'll be saying these are things we want but aren't getting at the moment? Well, the, the, we are in a coalition. <laughs> we're, no, we're, we're in a coalition that came together because of the terrible mess that Charlie and his colleagues left us after uh, the last uh, election, that, uh, which we have been Sorry. putting right over the last uh, three years. That, in the national interest, has been essential, but we remain two very distinct parties. OK. Um, Charlene Lawrence, please. Charlene Lawrence. What do you make of recent polling which suggests that support for Scottish independence is at its lowest level since the creation of the Holyrood Parliament in 1999? The, the latest figure from the Scottish Society is saying that the support for independence is now less than a quarter of, uh, of the Scottish lecture, 23%. Brian Souter, you're a great funder of the SNP. What do you make of the apparent collapse of the interest in independence? Well, I think you have to be very careful with these polls because they do change a lot, and a lot depends what question you ask as to what number you get. <laughs> You're absolutely right with that. Like, um, do you want to be independent <laughs> or not? Or one question. <laughs> I think there's a couple of aspects about this. I mean, I mean, first of all, the no campaign is, is certainly working very, very hard. And uh, I think the yes campaign... Uh, have got quite a challenge ahead of them to get their message across and convince everyone. I think the greatest tragedy of the referendum that we're about to face is that the option that most people would have wanted was over 60% consistently say they would like to have seen more powers for the Scottish Parliament. And we're not going to get allowed a say in that. There will be a, qu a one-question referendum when there should have been a two-question referendum. And therefore, we're not really getting much choice in this. We're getting presented with a death or glory referendum. And that's the choice that we've been given. And that's an interesting prospect. And uh, the No campaign wanted it this way because they feel it's, it's the easiest way for them to prevent Scotland becoming wait, independent. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Um, let's, let's start with the, the facts here. Um, Alex Hammond and the SNP won a majority in the Scottish... Parliament. They had a manifesto commitment for a referendum on independence. And I think we're in a pretty unique situation here where a UK government has worked very closely with the Scottish government to help them deliver an election pledge. And that was very clear. And it is the issue we now need to resolve. Is Scotland better off on its own, going its own way, or yes. staying yes. within... Yes. or staying within the... the, the, the <laughs> The, 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 you know, the family of nations, which is the UK, I think you know, we get a fantastic deal from being part of the UK. We've got our parliament, we have got our parliament here in, in Scotland, which is able to decide the key issues about health and education and transport that matter every day of our, our lives, as well as ensuring that when we need to be part of a bigger country for defence, for a place in the world, and get all the benefits of the huge UK economy, we get that too. That is a great deal, and I think that's why most folk in Scotland want to stay part of the UK. Okay. <laughs> Nicholas Sturgeon went to Ireland and looked at the Celtic kitten and the <laughs> European minister over there said, you won't get into uh, Europe. The Czech minister said, you won't get into Europe. Manuel Barroso said, you won't get into Europe. And Alex Salman won't give us a date for, for the referendum. And so he, people are losing faith in it. OK. Uh, Hamza Youssef. Yeah, well, a and, and remembering the question is, why is it 23%, yes. the lowest level since yeah. Holyrood began? Yeah, and look... Don't get me wrong, I mean, from those who are campaigning for independence in Scotland, we don't underestimate at all the enormity of the task ahead. It's a huge task ahead. The biggest electoral you know, uh, campaign that we face in the 80 years of our history as a party. Uh, and, you know, polls do go up and down. I remember, you know, the election that I got in in, in 2011, uh, three months before the election, we were 16 points behind, uh, 14 to 16 points behind. We ended up winning with the majority. But look, there's no complacency on this side. We know the enormity of the task. But 
Look, I, what, although I disagree with you, no, no, hold on. What do you make of it? Was the well, question. actually, yes. Uh, I think what, and I think it's a fair criticism of both sides, uh, is that, look, more meat on the bones has to come forward. People want to know, look, what does an independent Scotland, what will it mean? What will it mean for me, my family, for my pocket, for, you know, our future generations to come? And we have to start doing that. And the point that I wanted to make was, look, I obviously disagree with where Michael sits and Mary sits and Charlie sit uh, on this side of the debate. But I respect the position, absolutely respect the position, I disagree with it. But at the heart of this debate, and central to this debate, has to be what kind of Scotland do we want to see? What kind of vision do we want to have? And so we produced this paper that came out earlier in the week. And we produced a, a part of it process, of course, but part of it also vision. A written constitution that will have things like, OK, uh, prevention of homelessness embedded in a written constitution. We'll have things like no you know, prevention of nuclear prohibition on nuclear weapons in a written constitution. We'll have things, you know, protecting free education in a written constitution. That's the kind of vision. That's the kind of vision that we're putting forward that you want. We want to see of Scotland. Okay, All sorry, I hear. No, no, hold on, David. This is the final no, point. No, this no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. I want to take you back to the question, which is what you were asked, because you've had yes, endless, the, endless the opportunities the to talk about the benefits. Yes. But why do you think it's at its lowest level? I think, I think absolutely because people are wanting that meat on the bones, and I think the polls will absolutely change. Why would they? Because, because. Let me answer your question and then you can kind of patronise it afterwards. But look, the point of the question is this. People are asking... There's people no are asking, to be insulting about this. People, yeah. people are asking, look, what is the vision? And I don't get any vision from the no-camp. Genuinely, they don't get any vision of, look, the challenge for us as politicians in this exciting time of Scottish politics is how do we make tomorrow better than today? And all I get is, look, independence will come and the sky will fall, the earth will swallow you up and coronation will be banned from our televisions <laughs> forever and ever yeah. anymore. Okay. The challenge <laughs> is, look, how do we make Scotland better? And that scaremongering didn't work in 2007. All right, let's it won't go. work in 2011. Right, it won't work in 2014. All right, that, that's, the, that's the argument <laughs> for independence. But the question wasn't about that. It was about why the support for it is slipping. The no, woman no, over there at the very back. <laughs> what? <laughs> The woman talking about your nuclear weapons and that. You just joined NATO. That's not to do with nuclear. There's exactly. 20, you know, exactly. more, more than two thirds of the members aren't nuclear states in NATO. All right, so let's have a bit of order here. The woman at the back there, please, <laughs> on the right. Yes, that's you. I don't think um, it's it's possible for too much meat to be put on the bones at, at this point because and, and it's all very well for the the National Party to set out their vision, but surely, if independence is achieved. Their work is done, and it's then for us, the Scottish people, to take forward our, in our own democratic way um, how, how, Scot how our country goes forward. So you think the issue of just yes or no is the right issue, do you? And then you can decide subsequently. I think it has to be something of a leap of faith at this point, right. yes. The, the man here, in, in the, uh, no, not you, the man behind you. Uh, yes. I came to Scotland... Ten years ago, my children were all brought up and they were born in Scotland. I love this country. The issue I have is voting for something that I don't know what it really means. What does a yes, what does a no mean? And sorry, but the SNP has done nothing to clarify that question. So how can I vote for a yes if I don't know what that means? Char Charlie Fulk, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> is that the reason? Oh. I think what's... Up, I mean... Uh, it's an incredibly important issue for Scotland. The audience's reaction tonight is pretty uh, significant. Presumably what is happening in part is as a result now of a date being fixed or a month being fixed for the referendum. No, no, no Charlie, they've set the date when we'll become independent but not told us when we'll get the chance yeah, to have of, the vote. 2014, I mean, oh, you know, come on. Come on. You're, Tell us you're, mis date. you're misbehaving. An exclusive for question yeah, time. What's I mean, the, date? I, I, the exclusive for question time is that we're producing a referendum bill that will go through Parliament, which will have the date. You've had the urge <laughs> to find a date. This is coming from the Conservatives that have a 2017 referendum sometime in the future in 2017. I mean, come on, don't give me your hypocrisy. <laughs> you were elected, you were elected on an independence sorry. ticket. Sorry, sorry, before so that's why you sorry, sorry. Right. Back, back oh, to my, my, no. my understanding, though, I'll be corrected by this cacophony of noise, is that it's been agreed that there's going to be a referendum in the autumn of 2014 and as a result people are now focusing on the issue and as a result of focusing on the issue a number of things are emerging 
first of all, the point made over there, which is that Mr Salmon can't be relied on in relation to what he says in relation to uh, uh, independence or not and what the consequences are. Secondly, obviously, what will be the effect on Scotland of independence? Uh, as Michael pointed out, uh, I understand a, a, a document of some sort was produced by the SNP. I haven't read our document. No, actually, I have read your document. Oh, and basically what this document does, as I understand it, it came out at the beginning of this week, in the period from the time that the SNP win the referendum to, I think it's, is it March, March 2016? They're going to uh, separate the English and the Scottish armies. They're going to negotiate 14,000 international treaties. They're going to set up a Supreme Court uh, and they're going to join NATO as well as negotiating in relation to the European Union. I don't know what the civil servants and the politicians are going to be doing except for that, apart from that. But there's a more important point. If one is focusing not on whether the arguments are should there be independence or not, but the precise parameters of the party, and I mean the celebration, once they win, then it's perhaps not surprising that votes are going down for independence at right. the moment. Br Brian Souter, do you want to have a go on? This is going to be a battle between uh, two uh, great uh, opposing ideas. Uh, the hope and aspiration that we can actually make a Scotland that will be an exciting and great country to live in, and the fear that we have well, any change at all. Then. And let me just say this. I'm not afraid of a yes vote. Most people, the, the no campaign, I've got everyone terrified about the uncertainty and the change. I'm frightened of what happens if we have a no vote. Because a no vote means this. A no vote means we won't be able to reduce corporation tax and attract businesses to come to Scotland and create jobs. A no vote means we won't be able to take what's left of the oil revenues and address the appalling poverty in our housing estates. A no vote means that we will, we will, be, we will use these oil revenues at Westminster and we will never for another generation be able to do this. A no vote means Devil Max is off the menu and we are forgotten okay. about for the next 30 years. OK. Mary McLeod. I really hope the Scottish people vote to no in this referendum because, I mean, I love my Scottish heritage. I went to school in the Highlands, I went to Glasgow University, and now I live in London. And you know, I'm proud that I'm Scottish and I'm proud that I'm British. And I think that's OK. <laughs> But, but the, the, the SNP party, do, they do not have a narrative that works, and that's why there is not support for it. And they haven't said what they're going to do on currency, what they're going to do yes, about the armed forces, what are all yes, those things going to be? No, no, you, have, you, you, have, you have not got a clear plan and narrative about how you're going to make those things work um, under um, a, a Scottish um, new, new government and as an independent Scotland. And I really think, what I really want, why, why, what why, I really why, want why SNP to be talking wrong, about is what they are doing now to help. Help enterprise. What, what, they, what are what are SNP doing now to help business and enterprise in Scotland? I mean, Scotland was a nation of inventors, of entrepreneurs, of uh, people who actually really created things and delivered real value for this for for Scotland. And I really want to see more being done to encourage that spirit of enterprise and innovation. Something that I think Scots would be fabulous at, as they were in the past. And let's build on that history and heritage that we have well, to well, make Mary, Scotland well, Mary, strong. If, if, all, if all you can demonstrate to us is what the posh boys are doing in London. It doesn't What's have much appeal to us, let me you, tell you. You're a businessman. What's posh about enterprise? <laughs> <laughs> you made your way up that long now. Enterprise and social and social care. These from, are the two I things I want to hear from the audience and then I'll come to you, Hamza. The woman there in orange and brown or purple. <laughs> Black. I was going to say that a no vote will mean more years of Scotland living under the diktats of Southern England and a Tory government. And okay. we are fed up with it. Okay. Absolutely fed up with it. Second row from the back, yes, you. I want to know why is the UK government adopting the ostrich approach to pre-referendum discussions? Yeah. In, what, in what sense? In what sense that they, David Cameron stated that he, he doesn't want to talk about Scotland before the, the referendum. 
Uh, briefly, Michael Moore, then I can no, that, that, What matters is that over the next few months, we've got 18 months of fantastic argument to come. We, each side sets out its vision for the future, sets out what it wants to see Scotland do in the future. We'll be starting that process as the UK government from Monday. And uh, just in passing, let me deal with Brian's point about what no would mean. As a Liberal Democrat, I want to see more powers coming to the Scottish Parliament. It's one of the proudest votes I've ever cast was to create the Scottish Parliament back in 1998. Now we've got it. I think it, we've delivered more powers for it in the last year and more can come in the future. But we as Scots have got to decide what it is we want for that Parliament and then fashion it. As far as the lady's point about the discussing things, We've got to set out what is going to happen in this referendum process and, of course, from that we'll see how much of it can be speculated on and decided in advance and how much has to come afterwards. I meet with Nicola Sturgeon from time to time. We'll have discussions at the appropriate point. In the meantime, let's get on to the real issues, not the process issues anymore. All right. And, and uh, we, we, must, we must move on a minute. But, Hamza Youssef, um, you, it, it was said that, that the SNP hadn't got a narrative to explain. I don't want a shopping list of all the things you think you might do, okay. but can you explain sure. what the SNP narrative is, what the main thrust Look, of the I'm argument okay. is? I'll give, you, I'll give you in a sentence. I mean, I, I agree with that gentleman who made the point. Look, you know, we can't vote for something you don't know about. And so the absolute challenge for us in the next 19, 20 months, or how long it will be, that we, that we absolutely put, those, put, that, put that information out there. The narrative is very simple, uh, David. The narrative is, look, the people of Scotland know the best, the interests of Scotland. And so, you know, when it comes to an independent nation, when it comes to any nation, it should be the people that have that country's interests at heart who make the decisions for that country. It's as simple uh, as that. And just to address one or two very quick points, you know, I, I, you can be proud to be Scottish and proud to be British, Mary. For me, this has never been a question of identity. I come from a Pakistani Scots identity. For me, it's not about, you know, waving flags. I've said this before about waving flags. It's not about wearing the kill or eating shortbread. Yeah, incidentally, all things that I like do, uh, sometimes <laughs> at the same time. But the point being is that, that that's not what it's about. If you want to be proud to be British, whatever it is that makes you British, I don't think it's corporation tax being decided in London and not in Scotland. I don't think but that's what, what makes you, you British. What are you delivering for the Scottish Look, the people point, now? You are running uh, Scottish government. The, and the, the, Scottish yeah, government, we're making so. a lot of change with the powers that we have. I mentioned already about the NHS. And this idea about 14,000 treaties, Lord Faulkner, I, I was looking. Yeah. yeah, I was looking at one of them, and you know, yeah. we have the 1877 treaty with the King of Dahomey, which well, doesn't even exist. A lot of detail you has know, to be dealt with. Then the King of Dahomey is the King of Dahomey. Right. 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 So you know, I mean, so, 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 with, with the entry of the King of Dahomey, I think we move on to another another topic. Richard Burton, if I remember, went to Dahomey. Yes, um, went to Dahomey and, and, and paid homage to, paid homage, <laughs> Richard Burton, the explorer, not Richard Burton, uh, the actor, you understand. You've clearly read the tweet. Yeah, <laughs> a, a, yeah, a question, yes, <laughs> a question from Emma Caldwell, please. A question from Emma Caldwell. How can the Conservative Party claim to want a fairer, more equal society when almost half their MPs oppose the same-sex couple's marriage bill? More, yes, m more, uh, <laughs> more, more Conservatives opposed than supported uh, the proposal for gay marriage. Uh, Mary McLeod, how can you, how can you claim to, to, be a, to want a fairer society? Well, marriage is a very important institution in our country, even although I've never succumbed, haven't succumbed to it yet. But I Curious think this verb to use. <laughs> succumbing to marriage. It's not very attractive, Mary. It's been enticed it's like into marriage, marriage yet. It's not like E. coli. You know. <laughs> but this was a, a, a serious question. Um, and, uh, and it was, for me, uh, the whole issue around um, equal marriage was uh, a, a difficult one for, um, for me. Um, I was brought up uh, with my father being a minister in a Scottish Presbyterian church, um, a strong Christian, and who believed that marriage was between a man and a woman. Um, and so my, my, my view going into this was that I absolutely wanted complete protection um, of religious freedom um, because if something is about someone's faith, they have to be able to do that and express that, their faith in worship and what they do. So we had to absolutely protect that. And legally, that is what we have done with, with the bill. 
But on the other side, um, we also have to look at, as, the, as you rightly said, Emma, um, about equality and fairness. Um, and I felt that in certainly in state marriage, we already have a civil marriage. And in that civil marriage, um, given that uh, homosexuality is legal in this country, we cannot discriminate um, on things that are legal. So we cannot discriminate. And I don't believe in discrimination and I fight hard for equalities. But we shouldn't discriminate on race, on, on background, on sex, on gender. Um, and therefore, that is why um, I supported it. But I do think the core part of all of this was, uh, um, and I do understand that in terms of the, the question, that a lot of Conservatives didn't feel comfortable with it. And, and that was largely, I think, um, on the basis of faith. Um, but, you know, MPs voted for what they believed in. We had a really fair, I think, and measured debate. Um, and I think we, we both um, understood people's positions. And I want that to continue in our country. It's really important that people can have their own faith, express that faith, um, and still be respected for and how, it. Sir, just to get back to the question that Emma asked. How do you explain the Conservative Party as a fairer, wanting a fairer, more equal society? when more Conservatives voted against than voted for, yeah. after what you said about wanting yes, a fairer it, society it, in the way you defined it? Yes, I mean, it was, it was about, almost about half the party, but still slightly more against. 136 against, against, against and 127 yes, so in there, favour. there wasn't much in it, so it's a very split vote. I think it's because this is a difficult, um, uh, this is a very difficult thing, equal marriage. It's something that is based about faith. So I think it's not something that necessarily people see as not okay. being about equality, no, no. <coughs> but it's about something they feel really passionate about in terms of their religion. Charlie Faulkner. Your question was, how can the Conservative Party say it's for a fairer and juster society if over half its MPs didn't vote for uh, gay marriage? Mary did vote for gay marriage. She's doing her best to try and defend her party. But the answer is they can't claim to be in favour of a fairer and but juster David society. Cameron who brought the bill to the House in the first place. But half the party voted against it. Uh, I think most people would be in favour of people who are gay being treated in exactly the same way as people who are heterosexual. And that includes being able to express their love for one individual through marriage, which is what uh, heterosexual people have been able to do for a long, long time. And it's discriminatory against them. Uh, yes, I accept that there are some faiths that say they don't want to do it and they shouldn't be forced to do it. But there are a lot of people that are using faith as an excuse to express what are effectively discriminatory views, by which I mean they think gays are in some way inferior, therefore they want to oppose gay marriage. And I fear that's what was happening in quite a lot of uh, the Tory vote against gay marriage. I respect the views of very many people guided by faith, but faith should not be an excuse for a more pernicious view, in my view. <laughs> Yes, you. Um, I think it's right um, if, if um, two, two people want to live their lives together, that they should be allowed to live their lives together and it shouldn't be They shouldn't be, um, be di di dis discriminated against. Dis discriminated yes. against. Uh, and the word marriage is not one you think that should be reserved only for heterosexuals? No, no. not, not what about at all. The woman I think two you should be allowed. You. OK. And the woman two behind you there, yes. Um, thank you. Um, I just think that in the 21st century, really should is, is it right that we should be looking at the Bible um, for um, social policy? I'm a Catholic, I was brought up a Catholic, um, but I have absolutely no problem with um, gay, gay couples being allowed to marry. I think that when you... Um, we are discriminating by not allowing them to marry. That is a form of discriminating. And when you do that, it, it's always going to create that sense of unfairness. And it isn't fair. So, going back to that first question, I think that it's, it's not fair um, for the Conservatives to be, to be voting okay. against us. Brian Souter. I think for a lot of people, this isn't an equality issue. It's a morality issue. And that's why it's a difficult subject. And I think it's important that we respect everyone's views on it. I personally think that equality is very important, but I think it's delivered in the civil partnership. And I supported civil partnership because I felt there was an equality issue that gay couples weren't getting the rights that other couples had. What about gay couples? Can, can, can I finish? There, there are many people in the gay community who don't see this as a priority. And there are many. That's nonsense. There are many, and there are many people in the gay community that actually support traditional marriage. Christopher Biggins is one who said 
that he believed that marriage was a union between a man and a woman, primarily for bringing up family. Rupert, Rupert Everett said he thought that children needed a mother and a father. After he said that, he got death threats, right? Um, now, I think you've got to have sort of some kind of sense of perspective on this. Now, if we go ahead with this, which it looks like it's going to happen, we just need to think through some of the unintended consequences. I don't think this is such an important issue for a lot of people, if I'm being honest. It's a massive but if we put this issue. in place, what, what, why shouldn't we here, here's follow a countries like Canada and Denmark here. that here's have an enlightened view here. and allow people to marry in a church if they wish to, regardless but, of their but gender? We need, we need to work out what the social morris is going to be in Scotland, and we need to take it at our speed and do it in our way. Now, for instance, what are we going to teach in our schools about this subject? And at what point are we going to introduce this new relationship? Three, three, out of ten, three out of ten teachers in a poll that was published on Monday said that they were either uncomfortable or weren't prepared to promote this new relationship. So what happens next? If a teacher is a it's Muslim... It's not about promoting relationships. Just, 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 just if wait, if I, I'll come if to I, you. Don't I, shout out, because we can't actually hear everything you say. If a teacher well, we is can, a, actually, because your voice is very loud. <laughs> but, I, but I will come to you in a if moment. If a teacher is a Muslim and, and they feel it's against the Quran to teach this, do they get suspended and sacked? That's, that's the issue of education. You, you funded a, a campaign on Section 28, didn't you? Yes, yes I did. And that was to do with... <laughs> And that was to do with what we taught children in the schools, and yes. that's what I think the issue is about. But can I just say there are legal issues as well which haven't been addressed because... Excuse me. We have looked into the legal issues, and, and the one with teachers was something that I was, felt was really important as well. Um, and on teachers, they will absolutely not have to, prom to promote it if it is against their faith. Okay. That uh, will right. not happen. Well, that's good, because 56% of teachers have ex expressed concern about that. All right. All right. The ma yeah, yeah. Don't you, you think it's get unfair that... shouting, but I'll yeah. come yeah. to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go on. Don't you think it's unfair that we're allowing the old elite to dictate policy like gay marriage? It's shocking. It's outdated. Completely outdated. Hamza, <laughs> Hamza, uh, There's a few points to address. The original question. Um, with all the due respect in the world to the question, I don't understand why you expected Tories to be fair in the first place, uh, in fairness. But, uh, it states second, it on their website. Yeah, so I, I didn't come I, to you. I didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear what you shouted out, but you, from you know, feeling a rebuke from it. David, it's better uh, you don't. Uh, look, the way I look at this, uh, you know, conventional wisdom says that politicians shouldn't really do God, uh, but, but, but you know, I'm going to kind of break that convention for just a minute. You know, my faith is incredibly important to me. You know, I was brought up a Muslim, I still am, and, and I hold that faith and that, that, that identity very strongly within me. And so I absolutely think central to this whole argument is the principle of religious freedom. Now let me explain that just a little bit. So yeah, those who don't want to carry out ceremonies of same-sex marriage, be they imams, mosques, synagogues, churches, should absolutely be protected from having to do that. And nobody I've ever met in the equality uh, circumstance has ever said any otherwise. Absolutely should be protected. And those protections should be in law so that no imam, no clergy, nobody is forced to do that. But people have to understand at the heart of this, at the root of this, religious freedom cuts both ways. So those who are Unitarian, Reformed Jews, Quakers, who believe that that is their religious right, should absolutely have that religious right to do so. I mean, let me give a small example. Look, as a Muslim, there's no ambiguity in my religion about alcohol. You know, you're not allowed to drink it, that's it. And if you took a bottle of wine into the mosque, it would be absolute sacrilege. But look, I've never had a Muslim, and nor would a Muslim ever say this because it's not part of the faith. A Muslim would never say to a chapel or to a church, don't you dare take communion with wine to signify the blood of Christ. Just because we don't believe it, you know, it doesn't mean that we should stop people who do believe it. And, and, and you're so applying this law to homosexuality, so, so gay, 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 to gay relationships. You don't, but you believe they're morally no, wrong. No, 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 no. What I'm but, saying but is, you, but, look, you, my, but look, you would allow them to people no, despite people, thinking they're morally no, wrong. No, my, my point is, my faith is my private uh, matter. Of that, there is no doubt. What's your view about my, my point? Uh, is my point is, look, if people have a religious belief, let's respect it. 
But look, if their religious belief is that, you know, that, that gay marriage is This isn't the religious belief, this is the state allowing gay no, marriage. No, 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 it's not, no, it's not no, the Church no, of England allowing gay no, marriage. But, but it's Unitarians that want to do it, Quakers, Reformed Jews, there's many. Yes. It's actually but at, what about at the very, the issue at the for very the state? Heart. Sorry, what no, about no. the issue for the state? Would you have voted for it? Well, it's coming up to Scotland. Would I mean, you, look, and will you vote for well, it? Well, it depends what the consultation comes forward with, of course, because there are issues about protecting for the teachers. I thought it was SNP policy to go for it. Absolutely, and so I've said, look, if religious freedom is protected, then absolutely. You know, why should I stop a church that wants to celebrate uh, same-sex marriage? All right. Just because if my mosque or my faith doesn't believe in it, doesn't mean that I should be stopping people right. of another faith. I'm going to go to the woman who was shouting out an awful lot about Canada, but just, uh, do you want to say something now to the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> There's no need for it. I'm lost for words now. Yeah, I thought you would <laughs> No, I, d I think, um, in all seriousness, that the Conservatives need to remove the statement that they believe in a fairer, more equal society for all, regardless of sexuality, gender and race, because, as this uh, vote has proven, they clearly don't. Michael Moore. Half of them do. <clears throat> Half of the party. Ma 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 Michael Moore. As a Liberal Democrat, I was very proud to vote in favour of gay marriage uh, this week. I think this is a vote that reflects the attitudes across society. Uh, it reflects the changes that have happened over the last uh, few decades. And fundamentally, when two people love each other and they want to make the commitment to each other through marriage, I don't think the state should be telling them that they cannot do it because they happen to be the same sex. So it's really important that we give that equality, while also respecting that those of particular uh, religious faiths or who feel their interpretation of their religious faith, because most religions I understand and look at it are quite divided, that those who feel strongly about it are given the freedom not to be involved. And the important point, as uh, David has been saying, is this is about the state sanctioning marriage, and I think it's a major step forward and one we should all celebrate. And can you, um, <laughs> can you explain what the difference is legally between a civil partnership and the thing that you spent a, a whole day debating in the House of Commons called marriage? Interestingly, I, 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 I don't think I will try a technical de definition, but perhaps the, no, 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 more, important, more important one is, is, is about the status. A clear understanding that marriage is the highest form of recognition for a partnership between a man and a woman up until now and from henceforth for two men or two women who choose to make that solemn declaration to each other. Why should they not have the same status as everybody else who's been privileged to be allowed to get married and stay married for as long as they wish? So it's that the... is, for them, a very high status but and it... everybody should enjoy it. It is the words. In effect, there are no major legal differences between a civil partnership and a gay marriage. Um, what in a marriage they will take vows, which they don't in a civil partnership, um, and uh, and that's almost about it. The, the other uh, little if, bit if is that... in a, on a form they would previously have had to say they were single because there's not usually a box for a partnership. Um, and so, in a way, you're lying to so say you're single right. rather than married. So, why can't heterosexual couples who don't want to get married have a civil partnership? That's a I've very never, good question. I've never actually heard anybody say they wanted that rather than marriage. Well, I have. We've but, had people, but, 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 no, no, think, no, we've had think, people in question who don't like the idea of marriage, what you called succumbing to marriage earlier <laughs> on. They don't want to succumb to marriage. They just want to be joined for tax reasons and, right. you know, in, in, and, and in, it's not in, possible. In, in, well, in order of priorities, I think this has been the thing that people have recognised was completely out of kilter with what society expects and thinks okay. is right now. And so now we're putting that right. I'll take one more point from the man there in the second row from the back. You, yes. Can I just ask, why is this even a point? Why is religion allowed to confuse this issue? Just... Uh, uh, I, think, I think there's an answer to that. All right, briefly, and the, and the, the answer to that is because marriage has been underpinned by all of the great religions of the world and is part of our tradition. Actually, I think you've got to put this in context. I don't think that the man in the street is much bothered about this. I think our politicians got all steamed up about it. But if we'd had the courage to hold this in Raploch tonight instead of at the university, uh, let me tell you, and you ask the people in the streets in Raploch, uh, what are they concerned? <laughs> what, 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 what are people concerned about? They're concerned that one in four, or one in four of our young people cannot find work. They're concerned that welfare changes are coming in and children are going to become vulnerable as a result of that and they're concerned that when their kids go out in the street the drug pushers are trying to sell them a, a packet of heroin which is now cheaper than a packet of cigarettes these are the real issues 
but it's much easier to pontificate about this. Brian, thank you. Uh, on that point, we... On that point, we have to stop. Our time's up. We're going to be in Leicester next week. George Galloway is going to be one of those on the panel in Leicester. <laughs> Ooh. That's worth watching. <laughs> the, the response was worth watching. The week after that, we're going to be in St Paul's Cathedral, where we've never been before. And uh, if you'd like to come either to Leicester or to St Paul's Cathedral in London, uh, you can go to our website and apply there, or you can call the number on the screen, 0330. One two three ninety nine eighty eight. Uh, my thanks to all of you who came to Stirling tonight, to our panel, to our audience here, uh, and until next Thursday from Question Time. Good night. <laughs>《It's a Marriage of Political Programs Made in Heaven》tonight on BBC One. This week is our next.